welcome to this segment of Selectmen and Friends. I'm your host, Linda Phillips. This series of shows of Selectmen and Friends includes interviews with all of our Selectmen as well as the town manager and any guests they invite to visit with us. I want to introduce you to the people who make Reading a better place to live by their selfless service to our community. Today, we're here to chat with Selectman Chair John Arena and Town Manager Bob Lowishore. The topics we will be discussing have been chosen by each Selectman and the Town Manager. Chair Arena and the Town Manager will share information about issues and matters they feel would be of interest to our community. Today's segment will discuss Proposition 2.5 and, and property taxes and town revenues and residential and commercial tax rates. For future episodes, we'll discuss economic development and town organization by Barry Berman and Andy Friedman. And selectmen John Halsey and Dan Ensminger will discuss public safety, tax classification, and the role of Board of Selectmen in Reading, or what the Board of Selectmen does. I hope you will find this information helpful and informative as we begin the budgeting process over the next few months. We would like to hear from you regarding these shows. At the end of each show, there will be a slide with an email address on it for you to respond to us with suggestions or comments regarding each show. Only those letters that are signed will be responded to. We look forward to hearing from you. Now let's begin by having each person introduce themselves. Welcome Mr. Arena, John, and Mr. Lalashore, Bob. Thank you. Um, John, won't you share a little bit about yourself like um, how long you've lived in Reading and maybe a little bit about your family. Well, thank you, Linda. Thank you for hosting the show. I think it's a great idea. RCTV is a gem here in our town. It's a great opportunity to bring some of government and our civic activities uh, into a greater focus for the public. Uh, my wife and I moved into Reading in 1982. We've been married about a year. Um, the date is important. Uh, some may remember the interest rates back then. It skyrocketed. Uh, our first house, I think we'd the interest rate was 17.2 percent. I remember it well. Um, we looked at a bunch of towns and uh, settled on Reading, frankly, because we liked the neighborhood. Uh, with three children. Um, my oldest, I was born in 85. My daughter in 87. My youngest son in 89. Um, all went through Reading schools. All turned out very well. My son went to, was at the time Salem State, now University of Massachusetts at Salem. Uh, my daughter, Northwestern University, and my youngest son, Tufts, in University of Illinois. Um, like most dads uh, and moms, uh, we got involved with our children's daily lives, uh, first with Cub Scouts and later on with sports. I did Reading Youth Baseball, Reading Babe Ruth. I helped out with the wrestling team. My wife and I ran Friends of Reading Wrestling. It must have been between five and seven years. She is a treasure and me is uh, trying to ra ra rally the troops. Um, and like many parents, you end up focusing on activities that surround your children. That brought us into contact with many other families, and it was fun. When my children left, as, you, as many parents find, that opportunity to meet with other parents of school-aged kids tends to diminish. It hangs on for a few years, and then you realize, you know what, I've got some time on my hands. And that's when I decided, let me take a look at maybe giving a little bit back. When my kids were younger, it was, an uh, it was somebody else was serving in these roles, and now that I had the time, it was an opportunity for me to give back. I know that sounds a little corny. Bob, would you like to tell us about how long you've lived in Reading and a little bit about your family? Certainly. Thank you, Linda. Uh, my wife Diana and I moved to Reading in 1994, just a little more than 20 years ago. Um, our oldest daughter, Margaret, was one and a half at the time. Um, Emily came along shortly after that, so we have two very nice daughters. <laughs> they also went through the Reading public school systems and really enjoyed it. Um, you know, as a father of, of girls, I was probably a little less involved in their activities, which were many. Uh, La Pierre Dance certainly stands out as my daughter Margaret went there from very young age through senior. She was aiming for that her whole career. She was very proud. Uh, Margaret has since graduated from Wheaton College. Emily is in, in her junior year at Connecticut College. Um, they're both very active and, and very different and that's one of the things I appreciated as a father is two daughters that were very similar and very close have very different interests and need to be dealt with differently. Um, I worked in Cambridge and then Boston uh, when I first moved to Reading and uh, somewhat similar to John as I had a little bit more time on my hands I actually started as a FinCom volunteer and that's how I became introduced to Reading. 
Well, I myself have been in Reading 20 years, and we, my husband Gary and I raised two uh, daughters. We have that in common. Uh, they're two years apart, and uh, we have a blonde, a blue-eyed like Dad, and a brunette like Mom. And they are as different as they can be, and we're very proud of them. And I have three grandchildren, two grandsons and one granddaughter, and um, that, keeps, that can keep you busy as well. So we're happy to be here today. I wanted to ask a couple of more questions to you, to you guys. Uh, what, John, what was a compelling motivator for you to get in public service to begin with? As I said earlier, it was primarily the available time and the desire to, to, to serve in uh, served the town I lived in. I became a member of FinCom. Uh, I'd been a member of town meeting for a few years earlier. And I decided at some point to, de to run for uh, Board of Selectmen. FinCom is a great spot to uh, start if you're really interested in government. It gives you an, an opportunity to look at the cost of government, the, the organizations that uh, make it up, and how it operates. And from there, I, I moved in to uh, take a position on the board. And Bob, what was the compelling motivator for you to volunteer to be on FinCom? Um, you didn't know it was going to lead to this. No, <laughs> be careful what you volunteer for. Is my yeah, motto. Yeah. Um, it was similar to John. I, I had some some spare time on my on my hands. I did travel quite a bit in my professional life, um, so my schedule was not perfectly well known. But I definitely had some capacity, and I was just interested in learning more about Reading. Um, so I volunteered for the fina finance committee and was summarily told no the first time and was put on uh, some kind of a landfill development, uh, you know, the, the landfill development project. Be careful project. who you work for yeah. and then who yeah. ends up working and for And then you. a couple of years later, there was an opportunity uh, to join FinCom, and I was on that for eight years. Oh. Um, so that was my kind of entree. That's where I and, first met you. And, and a very telling thing to me <laughs> was I started to be annoyed when work would interfere with FinCom meetings, and I knew that meant something. <laughs> That's, that's so when my business yeah. travel took me away for a town meeting, it wasn't a happy thing. And then I realized, aha. Wow. <laughs> your yeah. heart lies somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> John, how does your day job or the occupation you do give you a grounding to assist you in your night job? It's an interesting question. No, it, it's, uh, I manage a line of business for a capital equipment company. We manufacture machines that manufacture electronics. So there's elements of, of meeting with customers, elements of meeting with the developers, elements of meeting with the executive committee, and, and trying to communicate the status and project um, maturity to, to these various constituencies. I travel quite a bit, as Bob uh, did in his earlier career, and I'm always um, in some corner of the world uh, a couple times a month. Um, and that's really given me, I think, an opportunity to relate to folks that may come with a different understanding, may not understand uh, the subject matter we're talking about and be able to um, recognize that we got to back up and explain, give them an understanding. I always feel like before we can actually talk about the subject matter, we need to be able to describe what the uh, ingredients are that we're talking about, how they come together, and what the output is. And I, I really feel much better if we simply can spend the time to go through it. Some of the stuff is not complex, but it looks complex just because there are lots of numbers and lots of unfamiliar words, but it's actually at its core relatively simple subject matter. And Bob, how does your day job, well, of what you used to do, <laughs> um, or your occupation give you grounding and assist you in your day job and night job now? Um, I was a, uh, a money manager previously, so finance comes fairly naturally to me. I have to say, in all honesty, I didn't manage the way a lot of people did, which was by numbers. I managed with relationships. I built a lot of relationships around the world with people. So I was dealing with information from people, not, not so much spreadsheets. And that part was very helpful, certainly coming to the town of Reading, where it's really a people job. Um, I'd say the most obvious difference between my day job and night job now is, generally speaking, my day job is operational. It's how to make the town government work. And my night job tends to get more into policy um, as, as to what is the uh, sort of top-down look at mm -hmm. the organization. Um, you know, Reading is really an extremely efficient organization, counting the town and the schools. Um, we're in constant contact. So the operational part of my job I especially enjoy because I deal with a lot of people. And then at night, it's usually with residents and volunteers, which I also enjoy. So it's rewarding for both of you, it sounds yeah, like. Absolutely. It, I, John's probably the same way. No meeting, no day is the same as the next one. You can't always tell what might happen. 
And I like that. That's fun. And it's a little different. You're dealing with people you see at Market Basket or on the street or at restaurants. These are folks you may not know personally, but they're people you come in contact with. So it's a little different. They than know you. They know you and you know them <laughs> or know somebody that knows them. And so it's more intimate than, say, a business setting where you may ne ne never have met an individual before. You get a better opportunity to build a relationship because you're all part of the same town. Um, th this was a question that I didn't give you a heads up on, but uh, John, this would apply more to you perhaps. Has your opinion of town government changed since you beca became working within it? It has. Um, I remember starting in FinCom and your first impression when you walk into a new organization, particularly without an understanding of how they work and without an appreciation of the of, uh, finances is, boy, there's a lot of money here. There must be an opportunity for savings. And you really have to hold that impulse back. I did. And when you get into it and realize just how the town um, manages its money, how it manages its resources, the town is, and the schools are remarkably efficient. Um, it goes to the point Bob made. It really, it really is based on relationships and the trust that comes from those relationships with people. You don't have to um, be in contact with everyone constantly, but if you have that relationship, you know that um, the town is in good hands even when a subject matter comes up you're not aware of. You know that there's an authority in place to deal with it and they're dealing with it in an appropriate manner. And Bob, you, you're kind of uh, on the inside, but can you think back to some of the things that uh, yeah, that you looked at differently when you actually became hired by the selectmen as a... Certainly, um, as a resident not involved in government, I had no idea what went on. When I then joined FinCom, I thought I had a pretty good idea of what went on. When I was actually hired by the town, I realized what really did go on. Right. And it's not the same as, as what FinCom sees. There's just so much more complexity to it. The FinCom is sort of the summary. Uh, when you think of all the work that the, the uh, town government does, it ranges, if you will, from library services, public safety, um, uh, police, fire, as well as DPW. There's a wide array of types of people that took jobs for different reasons. So to deal with, again, unions, non-unions, and all these people is really very interesting and, and somewhat challenging some days. Um, you know, it's a hundred million dollar uh, a year organization. It's a complex one with lots of different tasks, not all just doing the same thing. So I became, um, you know, very much impressed with how well organized and run it was under my predecessor, and as John says, how efficient it was, and um, how dedicated the employees are. They really are. That's been a, a quite a benefit to our community to have employees that perform under all kinds of conditions and, and all kinds of hours in some cases, but you had a little dry run because you were the assistant town manager for a while, weren't you? I was. Um, I, I was hired as the finance director, assistant town manager, Certainly that was invaluable experience to become the town manager. Um, town manager is becoming more like baseball manager. They jump around from town to town. I'm sure there's some benefit for that. But it's really very valuable to have spent some time and to live in your community and know it a lot better. So certainly, as John mentioned, FinCom's a great start to understand an organization. Being the finance director just upped that a lot. Um, I felt as if I had a pretty good understanding of most of the organization because I knew how the finance worked. And with that, you jumped forward to step in the seat of I town did. manager. I did. So we're lucky to have people well, thank like you. that. We are. <laughs> and thank you, thank both of you, as um, I have the others that we've chatted with for your willingness to serve our community. People like uh, that who are willing to provide the time and effort to make things work smoothly for the rest of us are truly uh, unique and they offer a very special perspective in our community and thank uh, we thank you and appreciate all of your effort in that area. And um, now I'm gonna let you two take the floor and talking about the issues you wanna share with uh, all of us in, in the town. And I don't know who's gonna go first. I'll I guess go first. Bob, you'll go first. Because who doesn't wanna talk about taxes? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just tell a quick story. When I was um, perhaps in my second or third year as a, as a finance director, I went to a conference in Boston and some software was being demonstrated um, to help us do something. It doesn't even matter what, because I don't remember. But I remember a group from Kansas City explaining how they used the software, how they implemented it, and all the wonderful changes they made within their organization. And I remember going up to them afterwards and saying, how did you possibly afford the cost of the software and the extra staffing you needed to do that? And they looked at me completely dumbfounded. What do you mean? We went out and we hired them. In, in 
Missouri, they didn't have Prop 2 and a half. Their budgets municipally could grow uh, anywhere from 5 to 10 percent a year without a problem. Um, I'm going to give a little discussion about Mass Proposition 2 and a half, which shows that our growth has to be very limited. Um, if you would uh, kindly put on the first slide, I'll take you through several slides that are very simple but quite, quite direct. Let's pretend the town has two homes in it, home A and home B. Uh, the assessed value is $1,000 for each. The tax rate is $10 per $1,000. Um, each one will pay $10 in taxes. Reading collects $20. Not a big mystery there. Uh, under Prop 2 and a half, taxes are allowed to go up that much each year. So let's just pretend that every four years, every one period of four years, they go up 10%. That's the easiest way to look at this. In slide two, you'll see that after that first uh, set of time, uh, Reading may collect $22. Since the assessed values are still the same, $1,000 each, that simply means the tax rate goes up to $11. So again, this is real simple math. 2.5% a year, each home is paying a little bit more in taxes. <clears throat> if you go to the next slide, it, it's where it gets a little bit more interesting, and assessed values change over time. For whatever reason, let's say home A was painted red, because I know this is impossible to be a factor, <laughs> and um, the assessed value went up, and home B is not, a, not red, and the assessed value went down. So all of a sudden, you have um, two different values, but the town itself still must collect 10% more than it did, or $24.20. 24 to 20 is divided by the assessed value and a tax rate is set and you can see home A will now pay more property taxes than home B because it's assessed differently. If we take that forward to the next slide, um, home B paints itself red and again that's an absurd example on purpose. Um, suddenly it's worth also $1,100. Um, Change, significant changes to houses, whether they're knocked down or whether an addition's put on, a garage is put on, is called new growth. Um, that is not subject to Prop 2 and a half. Uh, the town may collect extra tax revenue for that change. Painting red is obviously not the good example, which is why I use it. Um, so again, on the original $2,000, Reading may assess taxes, but there's something called new growth. So suddenly, Reading has more than a 2.5% gain in taxes in this period. Finally, in the next couple of examples, I'll just show you why assessed value is only a relative thing. Um, assessed value of each of these is now $1,100. Tax rate again goes up another 10% after four more years, and the town may split 32.20 equally between two houses. So again, each house is paying $16.10 on $1,100 assessed value. If you go to the next slide, let's pretend that instead assessed values went to $5,000 each for each of those homes. The town can still only collect $32.20 in taxes. The taxes, tax bills for each are 16, 10, just like they were uh, when the assessed value was much lower. So the, the most important lesson here is your assessed value per se does not tell you how much taxes you will pay. I know when I was a resident, the one thing I always looked at the tax bill was assessed value because that was my savings account. I had imagined, oh, the assessed value goes up, that's good for me. I never really looked at the tax bill much. Um, if you just go to the last slide, I'll sum up by saying that Reading annually must collect only 2.5%, but it also may collect new growth. In this example, it was a small amount of new growth. Since Prop 2.5 began, revenue collects, uh, Reading collects about 3% of revenues annually, combining the, three, the, the new growth plus the 2.5% uh, annual uh, Prop 2.5 number. And in so doing, we lag our peer communities. Our peer communities generally grow by 35 to 4%. There's a variety of factors to that we've studied through economic development, but the most common one is they have more vacant land than we do. We're rather fully built uptown. Specifically, your tax bill um, depends on how your assessed value changes compared to everyone else's assessed value. It so it'll go up 2.5% a year, but then there's the factor of how did your assessed value compare to everyone else. Your tax bill also will depend on did you do a major renovation to your home. Um, if you have, then it'll go up for that reason. And just as a point, assessed values typically lag uh, the market value of your house. I use a rule of thumb of by about 10%. Um, sometimes it's uh, closer to 5, sometimes it's closer to 20. Uh, but the good news is your actual market value of the house is higher than your assessed value. And the last comment I'll make uh, in terms of a Prop 2.5 and a half 
is right now the town has two debt exclusions, one for the high school and one for the library. Um, each of those is repaid in the next uh, few years, 2024. Um, so that's additional tax on top of Prop 2.5 that will disappear uh, in a period of time. And, you know, that's a couple hundred bucks on the average house that will, if you will, vanish. So that's a quick summary of 2.5. It's, it's actually fairly simple but complex at the same time. Um, looked at it from the town's perspective, it is very much a limit on the revenue we may raise to provide the services. Looked at it from the taxpayer's perspective, there are a lot of variables as to how your taxes may uh, go up, but as a group, all of you are going up 2.5% plus new growth every year. Thank you. On your uh, last slide, uh, Bob, under your summary, you had written here, since Prop 2.5 began, that is about three plus positive 3% revenue growth annually. Could you um, talk a little bit about the, um, what I think maybe John's going to cover it, but maybe you could just bring, bring it, uh, slip it in here. What grows the revenue? Those are variables too as well, aren't they? Explain a little yes, bit about um, that. Yes, um, 3% revenue growth for taxes is, is fairly simple. It's the two and a half plus new growth. Uh, Linda's right, there's another source of revenue. Our, our property taxes are about $60 million out of $90 million. We have other sources, the biggest single one being um, um, state aid from the Commonwealth. Um, that has lagged substantially. That has not grown much in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, the, the net growth is probably closer to zero uh, or maybe a couple percent. Um, that's much harder to know in advance what it might do, so it's a little more difficult to budget. State aid plus all our other revenues tend to go up less than 3% a year. So the property tax is the most reliable source of funding we have. And, and again, the rest of it usually does not go up at 3%. So our uh, total revenue growth is a little bit less. So our growth really depends on things that are variable. And the, and the town can't just go out and create a new project or product and uh, create a new revenue stream. Those are very difficult. Um, some years ago, town meeting did pass uh, a meals tax, as many mm -hmm. communities have. That was the first new source of revenue in quite some time. Um, you know, I, I understand the comment, live within your means, but most businesses have ways to introduce new streams of revenue. The town is very constrained in doing that. It, we're, we have a lot of creative people, and most of what we think about are illegal. So we'd, li <laughs> we'd, we'd oh, like to be able right? to do much more than we do. <laughs> it's just not allowed. <laughs> So that is a, it's, it's a contingency plan and a variable plan that, that leaves the right. uh, town budgeting process. Yeah, I suppose the good side of that is our revenues are not so volatile that our workforce and our services are at risk substantially every year. We have a generally good idea over the long run what the revenues will be and what the cost will be. So town government does not grow and shrink by half every couple of years as some private sector businesses must do. Um, and your last statement here on the debt exclusions for the high school. The high school, was that a 20-year debt commitment that we made? It was. It was. And the and library was a 10-year. 10-year, mm -hmm. okay. And they're both going to come due? They'll be paid for yes. by 2000. I thought it was important to have the library paid quickly. Uh, it could have been a longer one, certainly, but um, I just like to, I don't like to pay interest. It's just uh, not a good productive use of, of funds. Okay. I agree. <laughs> um, did you want to add anything to that, John? No, it's a perfect segue into uh, the discussion on where does the money come from. Okay. Um, if we could go to slide one, please. So as Bob mentioned, um, the sources of uh, revenue for the town are varied. Uh, this is a pie chart showing the primary five sources, and there, there are categories beneath the five, but I've summarize them here. Uh, the largest is the, the blue portion, about, um, sorry, the entire pie you see here is worth about $92.8 million. This is in this year's, this fiscal year. The blue portion is the residential revenue from the tax levy, that's $61.2 million. And the, uh, the portion to the left of it is the f mark 5.3, is that portion from the commercial. Those two together represent the uh, property tax levy total of uh, 60, $66.5 million. Uh, local, local revenues in the forms of the meals tax, uh, the vehicle excise tax, licenses and permits represent about $7 million. 
As Bob said, state aid is a, is a uh, large but ultimately flat source at about 14.1 million. And transfers from RMLD and other enterprise funds make up another four with free cash rounding it out uh, this year at about 1.2. Um, while there's a variety of sources, some are relatively flat and some are predictable. And in total, the, the revenue growth is on, on par with about 3% a year. We go to slide two. So as was mentioned earlier, uh, property taxes are the largest single source of revenue for the town. Again, assessed separately on residential property and on commercial, industrial, and personal property. You'll hear us talk about the term SIP or CIP. That's simply an abbreviation for commercial, industrial, and personal property. Our residential portion is about 92% of the total, and in commercial, industrial, and personal property is the remainder of 8%. Uh, that split is again 61.2 million for the residential and 5.3 for the commercial. Can I just ask sure. a question in between here? Do you know what that what that relationship of the 92 percent residential and the 8 percent business? How common is that? Maybe the town manager knows that in his um, municipal. Yeah, I, I could I could answer it simply. Um, we have 25 peer communities statistically that we use to compare uh, ourselves against. Um, we are a high residential community. Um, Burlington is one of our peers. They're one of the lowest residential based communities. And um, that provides opportunities and challenges, however your uh, demographics lay out. But Reading is, is probably the third largest amount of residential among all 25 communities. So that's very unusual, probably. It's a little bit unusual. Yeah. We're, we're a bedroom yeah. community. Yes. Yeah. Okay, just wanted to bring that point out. Okay, continue. But that, that, it's a good lead in, Linda. That disparity leads to this um, um, asymmetry between the two leads to an issue we'll talk about in a moment. The residential portion, that blue uh, pipe piece, is 11 and a half times larger than the commercial. And I'll talk about that further in a moment. That's, that's central to another discussion. Um, Reading has historically used a single tax rate for both the commercial and the industrial. If you'd move to slide four, please. Um, so our, our $67.2 million tax levy is weighted 92 to the residential and about 8% to the CIP, and I'm, I'm rounding here. Um, on Tuesday night, um, citizens heard a discussion on a, um, a commercial split that would move more of the uh, tax burden to the commercial and uh, therefore away from the residential. And that's a discussion we have every year in November at the Board of Selectmen. And Reading has historically, as I said earlier, um, avoided the use of a split tax rate. On Tuesday night, a, a very small split was uh, approved around the subject of senior tax relief. I'll go to slide, very five, sl slide five very quickly. Let me, let me attempt to explain how CIP shift works. I have two columns here, one mark residential, one mark commercial. And I've shown the split, the 92 of, on the residential and the 8%, 7.9 shown here on the commercial. The 92% number represents about $61.8 million. The 8% represents about 5.3. If we were to take 5% of the commercial burden, 5% of that 5.3 million, and add it to the commercial sector to pay again, in other words, raise that segment's taxes by 5%, the net benefit to the residential rate, because it is so much larger, is under a half a percent. And what, what would represent a 5% increase to, the, to um, a commercial enterprise valued at, uh, sorry, commercial property valued at 559,800, the same value as our average uh, home, represents $385 versus a $33 benefit on the residential. So that CIP split, that asymmetry, is what makes a CIA, uh, the benefit to the residential so much smaller. The easy way to think about it is if I had 100 children in the room and I divided them 92 on the left and 8 on the right, I gave the 8 on the right red cookies and I give the 92 on the left blue cookies. I say to the blue side, take 10% of your cookies and give them to the kids that have the red ones today. You'd end up with nine, over nine cookies. Each kid would get an extra cookie. If I do the reverse and I take to the group that has eight, take 10% of what you have and give it to the group that has the 92 blue, you have less than a cookie distributed among 92. It's that asymmetry that makes the shift um, difficult because the benefit is so much, is so diluted among the residential class 
and it's so intense among the, the commercial class. Again, I, I used a trivial example or, or, or an artificial example of a common valuation for residential and commercial, but in fact, our average commercial property assessed value is, a, is are on the order of a million six. So the actual tax paid is about for commercial properties is about three times that example I've shown here on the slide. That's kind of a quick example of CIP. I like the cookie example better because it's more interesting and simpler to digest. So, yeah, cookies are easy <laughs> to digest. <laughs> Of the two things that we talk about at the Board of Selectmen that frustrate me, one of them is this, because it's, a, it's actually a simple conversation, but there's so many numbers and so many movements that people get confused. And I, I, I frustrated it myself at our inability to talk about it in a simple fashion. The other is talking about debt and capital, which just drives people crazy because they, they think of it all as uh, uh, operational money rather than uh, long-term capital improvements. I think to John's point, one of the challenges um, we both face, uh, perhaps me a little bit more because of my finance background, is I'm too far in the weeds to be able to explain things sometimes. And sometimes at a selectman's meeting, uh, the five selectmen and myself are quite comfortable as if we're sitting at a bar having a conversation without the drinking. Um, and we speak at a, at a plane we're all very comfortable with, but I can only imagine it's very difficult. And Tuesday night would have been impossible for most people to sit in and understand really all the things that were being discussed. And one of the biggest challenges of my position, and, and certainly of the selectmen's, is to try to communicate with residents uh, some very complex issues and to try to boil them down to very simple points, which I tried to do earlier with property taxes. But um, to John's point, um, there is some frustration over trying to discuss very complex issues in a way that other people can understand it. Um, it it's just always a challenge. But the complex discussion must happen in order for the issue to be solved. And, and to Bob's point, you can't always boil a, a complex topic down to a s bunch of simple points. The analogies start to fail in, in, in the corners. You can make the main point, but other considerations that are real to the discussion, you eliminate for the purposes of trying to explain. And that's what, it makes, that's what makes it so confusing. I really wish we almost had an opportunity just to talk about these um, to interested parties. The time doesn't permit it. but. That gets to another point, which is um, when you're presenting to the public, I think one of the most important skills uh, to have is comfort with the subject matter, but also what I'll call stage presence, the ability to expre express it in a, in a manner that's easily taken up by the audience, reading the audience to see if they're making sense of it, and if not, being able to go back and correct or amplify or provide other working examples. Uh, it's easy to talk to members of the public and have them all nod their heads and in fact, they don't, they're not getting it. They're just simply trying to <laughs> yeah. be polite. And you really have to be able to read the, read the audience and see if those nods are simply ones of politeness or whether they're ones of comprehension. That's one of the hardest things about this. Yeah, feedback is good even in the process Th because that lets you know where people are coming from and what they are absorbing. And if they're, it, it's like putting a puzzle together, you know, when the kids were little, uh, we used to give them puzzles to do in between waiting for us to get ready to go somewhere or whatever. And, you know, of course, when they knew the puzzle, they could just, they, they didn't even have to look at the puzzle. They knew where the piece actually went. And it's the same with, um, you know, um, if you don't always follow every meeting and, and, you, and you get a grasp of the subject from six months ago and then the selectmen are talking about that again, um, if you have a little bit of a background in remember, oh, I remember when they talked about this. Now they're adding on to the information about this particular issue, or uh, they're enhancing it, or maybe this issue has gotten to the point where it's going to be a huge public meeting and it's going to end up a town meeting. And integrating that, um, in my experience, because I do get into people's houses as an antique dealer, and uh, my visits always last way longer than I planned but it's always nice to be able to chat with people because a lot of times they recognize me from town meeting uh-oh <laughs> and um, sometimes they have very good questions that they've been trying to put pieces to the puzzle together and they'll make a statement that shows me that uh, they don't understand and they need a little more help and so I always put the tea on and, and we'll have a little <laughs> conversation about it and that's why I thought these kinds of uh, sessions with you all with the selectmen on subjects you're quite familiar with, but that the public might, uh, it would give you an opportunity to further explain 
to the public certain things and maybe we'll get some feedback back and then we'll know um, if next time there's a FinCom meeting or some public meeting that we need to slow down and make sure everyone's getting the pieces together because if we don't put the pieces together we could be putting the pieces into the wrong puzzle so we need to put the pieces together so we can all make the best decisions for our community. That's going to be especially true in the coming months is a discussion in front of the board on the topic of an operational override and that's all I'll say in this meeting but all of the t complexity we've talked about thus far is going to be um, present in those discussions as well and so there'll be a need to be clear answer questions make sure the audience understands the subject matter and um, again in order to make everyone comfortable with where we, we end up do you have with the Either one of you like to add anything else to what each of you have said? Or? I guess I would compare us uh, loosely to a medium-sized corporation. $100 million a year is not small. Um, imagine a shareholder meeting once in a while mm -hmm. going into the depths that some of our residents ask us questions. It doesn't happen. Um, and you, it's really difficult to run an organization and give as much detail to a group of people who don't work there every day. That's, a, that's our challenge. It's certainly not a lack of interest in being transparent. It's just an ability to communicate. I think John's exactly right that when you have people in a room of any type, of any sort, whether it's town meeting or a small group, it's, it's easy to communicate with them. You can have a discussion. You can see eye contact. You can understand. But to discuss something with 25,000 people that you don't see and you're not interacting with is really a challenge. Um, you know, electronic media certainly has taken off in today's world. Um, that's not a good forum generally to have a good two-way educational discussion. It's usually opinions uh, jump in uh, very quickly. So certainly as town manager, I'm always interested in residents and businesses' idea of how we can communicate better. Um, we try lots of different ways. We understand lots of ways are needed for different people. But that's a topic we will always be welcome to your uh, feedback on, to how to, how to improve. Just to amplify that further, I, I, I support citizens giving their elected officials a call or an email and asking questions. If there's a subject matter after a Tuesday night or a subject matter after a school committee meeting, uh, we all have phones. We all have email addresses. We all, I, I welcome the opportunity to speak to the Sometimes public. you wish <laughs> you didn't have an email address. Um, I, don't, I don't use social networking for anything but restating facts. I don't do opinions. I try to, I try to avoid that because that, for, that forum, um, opinions can just run wild sometimes. So if it's a recitation of what happened on Tuesday night or uh, simply an explanation to how something works. But, but uh, you know, I'd invite members of the public to give me a call um, or any of, any of my elected colleagues uh, on Board of Selectmen or School Committee. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you for this format, Linda. This has really been great. And uh, I hope this format takes off. RCTV is really a gem here for our uh, community, and this is an opportunity for us to, in a, an hour or half an hour, to communicate subject matter that others may have been interested in hearing more about. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with John and say I, I hope that this is the start of many topical discussions that uh, you know my colleagues as well as our elected officials can have. Um, you know, in the future we'll certainly set up, and I know you'll request any feedback, um, what topics you're interested in. Um, you know, taxes is probably not that interesting other than everyone pays them. Uh, but if there's other topics, we have lots of subject matter experts in, uh, in, t in the employment of the town and the schools. And uh, we'd welcome having a discussion like this. And thank you, Linda. Well, I want to thank you gentlemen for being here today. I know we had a little, took a, a little time for us to get scheduled and to get everyone scheduled at a time that they're comfortable. We want to thank you as members of our Reading community for taking the time to watch this show and hope that you found it interesting and informative. And thank you gentlemen again for your service to the community. It is invaluable and many of us appreciate that and we should say thank you more often. So with that, we'd like to say, we said hello Redding. Now we're gonna say goodbye Redding. And we'll see you next time with another segment of our series, uh, Selectmen and Friends at Hello Redding. Thank you for watching.